One of the offshoots of the preoccupation with rich and poor has been another definitional catastrophe, hunger in America. Here many advocacy groups put out many kinds of statistics designed to get media attention and spread enough alarm to produce public policy favoring whatever they are advocating. The definitions behind their statistics seldom get much scrutiny. One hunger activist, for example, determined how many people were hungry by determining how many were officially eligible for food stamps and then subtracting those who in fact received food stamps. Everyone else was hungry by definition. Using this method, he estimated that millions of Americans were hungry and produced documents showing the 150 hungriest counties in the United States. Of these hungry counties, the hungriest county of all turned out to be a ranching and farming community where most farmers and ranchers grew their own food, where farm and ranch hands were boarded by their employers, and where only two people in the entire county were on food stamps. Because some people in this county had low money incomes in some years, they were eligible for food stamps, but because they were eating their own food, they did not apply for food stamps, thereby becoming statistically hungry. Again, studies of actual flesh-and-blood human beings have yielded radically different results from those produced by broad-brush statistical definitions. When the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the Centers for Disease Control examined people from a variety of income levels, they found no evidence of malnutrition among people with poverty-level incomes, nor even any significant difference in the intake of vitamins, minerals, and other nutrients from one income level to another. The only exception was that lower-income women were slightly more likely to be obese. Such facts have had remarkably little effect on the media's desire to believe that the rich are getting richer while the poor are getting poorer, and that hunger stalks the less fortunate. A CBS Evening News broadcast on March 27, 1991, proclaimed, A startling number of American children are in danger of starving. One out of eight American children is going hungry tonight. Dan Rather was not alone in making such proclamations. Newsweek, the Associated Press, and the Boston Globe were among those who echoed the one-in-eight statistic. Alarming claims that one out of every eight children in America goes to bed hungry each night are like catnip to the media. A professional statistician who looked at the definitions and methods used to generate such numbers might burst out laughing, but it is no laughing matter to the activists and politicians pushing their agenda, and it should be no laughing matter to a society being played for suckers. One of the common methods of getting alarming statistics is to list a whole string of adverse things, with the strong stuff up front to grab attention and the weak stuff at the end to supply the numbers. A hypothetical model of this kind of reasoning might run as follows. Did you know that 13 million American wives have suffered murder, torture, demoralization, or discomfort at the hands of left-handed husbands? It may be as rare among left-handers as among right-handers for a husband to murder or torture his wife, but if the marriages of southpaws are not pure, unbroken bliss, then their wives must have been at least momentarily discomforted by the usual marital misunderstandings. The number may be even larger than 13 million. Yet one could demonize a whole category of men with statistics showing definitional catastrophes. While this particular example is hypothetical, the pattern is all too real. Whether it is sexual harassment, child abuse, or innumerable other social ills, activists are able to generate alarming statistics by the simple process of listing attention-getting horrors at the beginning of a string of phenomena and listing last those marginal things which in fact supply the bulk of their statistics. A Lewis-Harris poll, for example, showed that 37% of married women are emotionally abused and 4 million physically abused. Both of these include some very serious things, but they also include among emotional abuse a husband's stomping out of the room and among physical abuse his grabbing his wife. Yet such statistics provide a backdrop against which people like New York Times columnist Anna Quindlen can speak of wives' risk of being beaten bloody by their husbands. Studies of truly serious violence find numbers less than one-tenth of those being thrown around in the media, in politics, and among radical feminists in academia.